right now is a time where if you want to survive and thrive in uncertainty, get close to your customers. I would say you want to party where your customers party. At the end of the day, whoever gets closest to the customer wins. We have the pleasure of welcoming Caitlin Burgoyne today to our interview series. I'm Sumita Mariam from the People Hum team. Before we begin, just a quick introduction of People Hum. People Hum is an end-to-end, one-view integrated human capital management automation platform, the winner of the 2019 Global Cody Award for HCM that is specifically built for crafted employee experience and the future of work. We run the People Hum blog and video channel which receives upwards of 200,000 visitors a year and publish around two interviews with well-known names globally every month. And now for our guest, Caitlin Burgoyne is the founder and lead trainer at Customer Camp. She is a highly sought after growth strategist and speaker. She's been named as an influential entrepreneur by Forbes and was one of the top 20 wonder women of software as a service marketing and growth. She conducts great workshops on improving customer relations. Bringing with her an experience of over a decade, we are happy to have someone of her stature on our interview series. Welcome, Caitlin. We're thrilled to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. It's our pleasure. So moving on to our questions, the very Mm -hmm. first question I have for you. Can you tell us a little bit about your interesting work with Customer Camp? Sure. Um, so I, Customer Camp is um, actually my fourth business. Um, and it's sort of the evolution of the things that I've done in the past. So I had started a branding agency about 10 years ago. Um, and then from that, I ended up starting actually a restaurant consulting business, which I sold off fairly quickly. And then I decided I wanted to build software. And so that's how I launched uh, my tech startup, which is what most people know me from. And we had some bumps in the road along the way. Things were looking really good. <laughs> At one point, um, Forbes said we were going to be the next LinkedIn for women, but unfortunately that didn't quite happen. So when we ended up winding down that company, I went back to working um, as a marketing consultant and I had the opportunity to work with all of these amazing uh, software teams that I'd met in my own journey and they needed marketing help. We weren't so great at building product, but we were really good on the marketing side. And I found that a lot of teams had the opposite problem. They were really good at building product, <laughs> but they struggled on the marketing side. And so I would sit down um, with these teams and I would ask them what, you know, as a marketer, the most important question you need the answer to, which is tell me about your customers. And what I was surprised by was how often people didn't have a lot of clarity on their customers. They knew that they were kind of going after people like this, or you'd have two people on the team that were kind of, um, uh, they would debate back and forth about who the most important customers were. And I thought, this is so interesting. So you've got these incredible teams that are really good at building great products, but they're not super clear on who their customers are. And so I actually did a poll on Twitter and I asked, other freelance marketers and copywriters. And I said, how often when you go out and start working with a new client, do they need help figuring out who their customers are? And it came back to 88% of the time, businesses needed this help. They didn't know who their customers were. And that was really what propelled me to do what I do today. So it started off, I was working one-on-one with companies, helping them figure out who their best customers are, understand why those customers to buy so they could just market a lot smarter. Um, And then there was a lot of demand, so I created Customer Camp, which is uh, training and workshops where we work with companies to help them figure this out in a group um, training environment. So that's kind of like how I got there. Um, But it's it's just that journey of all of those different things that I did over my own career that got me to there. That's wonderful. So we've seen an evolution of organizational cultures and we've seen it going from business centric to customer centric and then it has evolved to employee centric. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing that all organizations try to, you know, put out there is that once your employees are happy, once you treat your employees the way you want them to treat your customers, everything is done. So My next question would be, you know, uh, how would an employee centric culture lead to a better customer service experience for an organization? Well, I mean, I know that you guys probably have all the data behind this, but I've, I've heard from so many studies, the happier a team is, the better, the faster the company grows. Because when you have really engaged, happy employees, they 
treat your customers really well and those customers become loyal and they tell other people about you and they're really happy. So it's, I mean, it's really comes from understanding as an organization that the, you know, you need to make your customers happy, but if you are doing, if you're not focused on making your employees happy and really making them engaged and excited about the work that they're doing, then that will ripple out to your customers too. So I'm sure you guys have tons of data on it that I don't have, but I just know that it starts with making, you know, if you want happy customers, first you have to have happy employees. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. So talking about employees also, can you tell us, you know, the importance of a talent brand for an organization to improve its profit? So I think that right now we live in the knowledge economy, right? Where a lot of the best businesses in the world, there there's knowledge workers that create these amazing products and solutions that we love so much. And what's one of the biggest competitive advantages a team can have is having the best team. And how do you get the best team? Well, you need to be able to attract that team by showing them why they should work with you. And so there have been probably um economies in the past that were really where employees were somewhat at a disadvantage they were competing for jobs now companies are very much competing for talent in a major way and you see the companies that just take off like a rocket many of them have incredible corporate cultures and so that now is such a thing that teams understand if we want to compete we can't just have the best product we can't just have the best marketing for us to have those two things we have to have the best culture so it all works together. Yeah, so even I think a lot of the new age organizations are finding it fairly easy to, you know, put out a very good organizational culture and, you know, keep the employees happy and build a good employer brand, a good talent brand. So mm -hmm. keeping that in mind, you know, what according to you are the greatest challenges that startups are facing, you know, when it comes to establishing a good ground for customer relations? I think that there's so many challenges. I think that one of the things that I talk about often is that it's never been easier to build a company than it is today uh, because there's just so many amazing tools out there that make the actual um, challenges and barriers to creating a business really low. You know, like we can all have a Shopify store within 30 minutes if we want to start selling stuff. We can all kind of like put up a website and become a, um, a freelancer in like a matter of moments if that's what we want to do. If you want to build a tech company, there are tools that allow you to even like launch an app without needing to know how to code. And so from one perspective, that's terrific because it means a a lot more people can start companies than used to. Um, but from the other perspective, it just means there's tons more competition. And for your customers, they're being inundated with messages from companies that want to basically steal them and get them to be their customers. And so it's never been more important for companies to realize that it's all about the customer. You know, it's all about making sure that you create this incredible experience for that customer. And the way that you do that is by talking to customers. Yeah. And in the past, companies weren't particularly good at this. You know, we, they would send out massive surveys um, and hope that they get all the information that way. Or they'd look at um, only at analytics and data and hope that they could find out all the information that way. But really, a huge, huge um, opportunity that's often missed by companies is just to have conversations with their customers, especially customers who have recently bought from them, because those are going to be the people that remember their buying journey the best and can explain to you why they chose you. And so really it just comes down to know who your customers are, know why you, why should they choose you, and the way that you continue to make sure that you continue to deliver the best experience for them is you just keep engaging them, keep talking to them yeah so um i would also like to ask you you know this is a very different time this is the you know the coronavirus and the quarantine and all of that so in this situation how would you advise organizations to provide the best customer support and if i may add to it how important is technology in you know like uh giving your customers the best experience mm -hmm. I think that that depends. It so depends um, on the style of business that you're running, the um, type of customers that you serve. It's, you know, there's no one size fits all solution for that. Right now, I'd say what companies need to do really well um, is they need to be listening to their customers. They need to understand how their situation may have changed 
over the last several months and what it looks like it's how it's going to be changing in the future they need to be listening paying close attention and looking for ways that they can help because the best marketing doesn't feel like marketing it feels like helping it feels like you're learning it feels like you're engaging you're entertained you know the show that you're putting out this is about entertaining and educating and so the best marketing it feels like helping and it's very relevant and it feels like it was like oh you read my mind that's exactly what I needed. Well, the way that you can figure that out is by talking to your customers. Because what might work for one um, company, even your competitors might not work for you. And so brands need to stop looking at just the competitive landscape and like copying each other and really get narrowed in on how can we understand our customers needs so well that we can help them right now in a way that builds a lot of loyalty and trust and that they stay customers and that they tell their friends. So when you work in the B2B space, right, when you sell a software as a service, so right now all your customers are cutting down their costs to what is essential to them. So how would you advise an, an organization that sells uh, software as a service, you know, to, um, to connect with their customers and engage them and, you know, try and make them understand how important of, how important of a software that they are providing? Mm -hmm. I would say there's a couple different ways that I would go about doing that. Again, it comes back to talking to your customers. So who has bought from you recently since this has happened? Because those customers pro probably have stories that are relevant to lots of different types of customers. And so really understanding why they bought, why now, what was it that motivated them to make the decision now is incredibly important. And as yes, it's like, Brands are going to focus on what is essential and that's why it's more important than ever for software companies to be to understand what does matter to their customers and to communicate clearly. So really getting tight on your value proposition and understanding that that may have changed from what it was a month ago. And the only way that you can get clarity on what they need now is by talking to them. Now you can go, um, you know, if you have customers that all kind of like hang out in a particular place, like maybe there's forums where they're talking, there's, um, uh, they're speaking at events, that sort of thing, like online events at this point, um, you can go and you can listen in and you can glean some insights that way. Um, but that's not going to be as, it's not going to be as relevant to you as talking to your own customers. And it can be people who, you know, let's say that you haven't had a lot of sales since the, the coronavirus. Let's say that things have really slowed down. It can be talking to those people who were in your pipeline and who were moving along and then suddenly hit pause and try to understand from a research perspective why they hit pause. Um, so there's some really good research that ProfitWell put out um, a couple of years back and it showed that companies, um, software companies specifically, um, that speak to 10 customers a month in a non-sales capacity grow two to three times faster than the ones that don't. Yet 70% of companies aren't doing this. And it's because we're all busy, we've all got a lot of stuff on the go, and so we don't make time to have those conversations um, unless we think that there's gonna be sales that are gonna come with it, unless we're doing customer support, we're not making that time. And because we're not making that time, we're probably wasting time and resources on things that aren't working as effectively as they could be. So I would say right now, if you are seeing sales slow, um, then you need to know what your customers need from you now so you can adjust your messaging and adjust your approach for today. So the way that you figure that out, you can guess and you can hope that you're right, or you can go and talk to customers and have a better chance of being right. So do you see a generational gap and, you know, different methods to, you know, market to different um, groups of your customers? Like you have the millennials and then you have a different generation an older generation. So do you think we have to go about in a different way to approach these two groups of customers? I would say you want to party where your customers party. That's what I always like to say, right? And so if you, if you are serving, you know, a generation Z, right? They're not signing up on Facebook the way that millennials even did. Like they're more active on other channels. If that's who you're serving, you want to party where they are. If you're serving multiple different types of customer segments, then you might need to be in a few different places to have meaningful conversations. But go where they are and engage in a way that is relevant to them. And so 
yes, like, you know, the channels that you choose, whether you do Facebook or whether you do a blog or whether you do Snapchat or TikTok, like that will depend on some of your customers' demographic information, like their age and their location and stuff like that. But the type of content that you create and the type of stories that you tell, all of that comes back to what are your customers trying to get done? What matters to them in their life? How do they want to feel? And you can find that out by talking to them. It might actually not be that different between generations, right? Like right now with coronavirus, all of us want to feel secure. We want to feel safe. We want to know that the future is not going to be dark. We want to feel connected because we probably feel unconnected right now. And that's probably true whether you're a 22 year old or whether you're a 72 year old, right? And so understanding like how your customers want to feel that bridges generations and, but where you go to have that conversation with them, where you share your story, that might be specific to the type of um, channels that they're using, whether it be Facebook or LinkedIn or TikTok, but the way that they want to feel that might be the same. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's a, that's a great thought. And also being an entrepreneur, I would like to know your thoughts on the increasing momentum of the gig economy. I mean, the, with the increase in the millennial and the Gen Z workforce, it's not just delivery boys or coffee servers for the, in the gig economy. It's a lot more. So how do you think the gig, the gig workers are going to, you know, fit in the organizational setup that we already have right now? Well, I think that humans in general are very, very adaptable. And the gig economy has, has emerged because it was something that people needed because we, you know, it's a lot of young people, especially people have more debt than they used to have. They, you know, costs are rising and they have all these unique and interesting skills that they want to be able to use. Um, and people don't want to be stuck in one job from, you know, 24 until 60 and then retire. They have different desires than they used to have. So I would say that the gig economy, it will certainly change the way that it, it changes the way that the world works. And in some ways for the better, because it gives people choices. Um, it gives you new avenues to explore new types of offerings you could be doing. And it gives you a chance to test things out and to see if you do want to go on business on your own. Maybe you just want to do a little bit on the side. You know, maybe you want to drive Uber or like do graphic design or whatever it is on the side to make a little extra money right now. So I think that the gig economy, it's a really neat opportunity for people to try things out and figure themselves out. Because I don't think any of us really know what we want to be when we grow up. Like, I think we're always still searching to figure that out. Yeah. And the more things that you can try and explore, the more clarity you get on what you love and where you should be and what you should be focused on at work. Yeah, so I think working for the gig economy as, you know, uh, as a part of your whole, um, you know, jobs or career is the better option that we can have. And I was also talking to this uh, influencer named David D'Souza and he had this opinion that, you know, the gig workers are not going to be just gig workers because we see a recession, a depression coming and people need financial security. So mm -hmm. we might see a dip in just the gig workers. But as you said, we'll have gig workers who are also full time workers for other, you know, other organizations. So, yeah, I think that's that's very relevant. And also, Caitlin, to, uh, you know, wrap up the interview, the last question I have for you. If there are any important sound bites that you would like to leave our audience? I think that, you know, I think that the thing, we're looking at a future that feels a bit uncertain. And I think that this is going to change us. It's going to change the world. It's going to change the way the world works. And we're going to see things are going to be different, but different doesn't have to be bad. And different can actually be how do we design a better workforce? How do we design a better economy? How do we design um, a labor force that actually works the, the way that people want to work and respects people? And so I think that at the end of the day, we're looking forward and we don't know exactly what it looks like, but let's also look at that as a positive. I and mean, this gives us a chance to design something that's better than what we came from. And the companies that are the most successful in this, they're going to be the ones that really deeply understand their customers. They're going to be the ones that are listening 
and paying attention to those customers. At the end of the day, whoever gets closest to the customer wins. Uh, that's one of my favorite sayings. And so right now is a time where if you want to survive and thrive in uncertainty, get close to your customers, spend more time understanding them and really making sure that you're serving their needs. That would be what I'd want people to know. That, that's great. That's great. You, you, you can always stay positive and uh, I'm sure our viewers are going to enjoy this. So I had a very enriching experience with you, Caitlin. Thank you so much for coming to our interview series and sharing so much information in such a short time. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me. It's our pleasure to have you. Stay safe and healthy is all I have to say. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.